recording here for the cloud. And uh, we should be recording now. Cool. Uh, it's been years since I've been able to make a meeting up there in person. Uh, probably 15 years ago when Josh Moore was around here, that's when I first started going to meetings because my wife had relatives up there. But, uh, you know, in the last 10 years, we haven't because her mom passed. And uh, we still got some friends, but maybe once a year, whatever, we stop in. But, you know, I'd just like to say hi if anybody's been around for a while. Uh, Josh was at a big shop downtown. It started with an A. And I remember going to meetings down there. And But I don't know if any of you guys were around. Uh, anyway, uh, I live in St. Louis. Uh, you can see my desk behind me. It's actually a 12 by 12 foot room with a desk on all four sides. And I built this 40 years ago. I probably built it 37 years ago, something like that. Uh, we bought a nice big house and decided to take the whole lower level. So anyway, um, I live and breathe Linux all day long. Oh, by the way, if anybody's a VMware expert, ping me offline. I got some issues trying to run converter on old, old VMs. They keep crashing. So Andrew asked me if any topics floating around, and I had actually done a tour presentation a couple years, three or four years ago at the group here in St. Louis. All right, where'd my window go? God damn it. Uh, we are seeing your uh, slide deck here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking I'm looking for the one where I can change the pages. I shared the presentation window, but the, the source window is gone. Anybody have an idea on that? Uh, what presentation system are you using? Uh, open ODP. Uh, so if you just press the the back and forth arrows, will that be, will that there take you? There it is. Okay, I got it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't get back to the, uh, the screen, you know, with the arrows because I can't do it looking at the presentation. Anyway, uh, I had done this uh, many years ago at, here in St. Louis, and so I just did an update on it and cleared out, cleaned up a few things and. Uh, Andrew thought might be a good topic. Anyway, uh, I'm sure everybody's heard of Tor. It's been around since the mid 90s. Originally, uh, DARPA was using it. There's uh, EFF sponsors it now, and there's a Tor project. The the whole point is, you, know, you might think, well, you know, why would the government sponsor technology to let you surf the dark web? But there's a lot of better uses for it. You know, for example, it's one of the key technology enablers for Edward Snowden seven years ago. And there are lots of details on Wikipedia. And in fact, if you ever want some good reading, there was a, a paper done uh, uh, for EFF back in 2013 called Egotistical Giraffe. Uh, it's pretty cool talks all about Tor and one of the big reasons for doing it is for human rights because there are a lot of countries out there that have governments to try to censor and once in, once the internet started being ubiquitous back in you no know, probably the early 2000s late late 1990s there were a lot of countries out there that wanted to censor it well that was one of the big reasons why the US supported it the whole idea is to give people around the world a free source to connect to in, or a free method of connecting the information that is not censored by the government. Uh, you know, the, uh, in addition to that, you can use it for private emails. You know, you can, uh, uh, you know, a lot of countries are going to block proton mail and sources like that. So with Tor, you can get there. If you want to connect to Facebook, some countries block Facebook. You can use Tor to connect to Facebook. Research topics like AIDS or birth control in countries that censor it. 
And one of the big uses is journalists. If some journalist wants to write about a topic that their government doesn't like, well, the government might censor it. The tour gives them a way to get it out, to get it to the rest of the world. And finally, like arguably Snowden was, whistle whistleblowers tour helps keep them safe. You know, there is actually, I'm sure everybody's heard of the dark web. There's a lot of the internet that is unavailable to the public prim primarily because they block all search robots. Uh, and let's see, I don't remember, sorry, I don't remember what this graphic, oh, daily tour users, you know, 2,500, 10,000. And these are basically outlined in a world map. You can see some pretty big highlights here in Asia. Over 200 tour, over 200 tour users per 100,000. Nowhere near as high in the USA are most of the free countries, but a lot of the strict government countries have a very high percentage of tour users. And so apparently France. Yeah, yeah. All right, so basically there is, there are two points in the Tor network, a user on the left and a service somewhere on the right. Although we'll talk about here in a few minutes how there's two ways to handle that. So basically the whole idea is once you initiate a connection into the Tor network, your route through the network is totally random until you either connect to a Tor endpoint or you exit the Tor network. Uh, the picture here actually depicts exiting the Tor network to a public site. And that uses an exit node in the Tor network, which is, has some pretty big pluses and minuses of with it, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes. The basic Tor connection is similar to VPN, but it is anonymous. The entry point you make when you initiate a connection, it is secure because you initiate the connection across the public, uh, across the public internet. And we'll, we'll see the handshake here in a few minutes. The routing is random and unpredictable. Uh, and because of that, since you never see multiple packets through the same point, it means that you don't have to, uh, there's no way to profile the traffic. Uh, but the downsides, uh, most importantly, if you're looking at the Tor browser, which we'll talk about, is performance. Performance takes a significant hit jumping into the Tor network. In, in some cases, you can't get to some sites, uh, you know, because of traffic. A second negative, again, most importantly in a Tor browser, uh, is that if you have an IP-based authentication, it's not going to work. Also, if you're using a browser, it must be securable, i.e., forget about Chrome. Firefox is the only browser that Tor supports directly, which we'll see here in a few minutes. Uh, and also you can't use any scripting in the browser because almost every scripting variation, JavaScript, uh, C Sharp, whatever, uh, it's possible to put tracking tools in there to figure out who you are and where you are. So if you're using a browser like that, you can't do it. You know, it's not allowed. Basically two ways to use Tor. The Tor browser, which we'll see is Firefox plus a Tor client. It's a significant privacy tool for public connection. Work to see. Uh, sorry guys, I just winked out here. So while you're working on that, I did think of one other uh, news uh, item. Uh, oh. Um, I think we may have lost Lee uh, completely here. Hopefully he'll uh, be back online here in just a second.
maybe. What was the news item, Andrew? Uh, so I, I had a news thing and then I completely forgot it. Hey. Uh, yeah, it's looking like Lee is uh, completely uh, uh, blacked out here. Oh, yep, there he went, uh, ending uh, completely. Uh, so, yeah, uh, hopefully he'll be back here in just a, a couple seconds. I know one of the things I've used uh, Tor for uh, in the past, I, I haven't uh, had it hooked up since we moved but I had a Raspberry Pi that I put uh, as a uh, onion route and then used it as a jump server so I didn't have to necessarily know what my IP address was or even open up a hole in my router or anything like that. As long as you knew the onion route, you could then SSH onto the box and then jump onto my uh, local network. Uh, anyone else working on any cool uh, projects here? We'll put them recording. All right. Yeah, the problem is. Uh oh. Yeah, that, well, when I share the screen, my uh, gallery goes away. Anyway, let's pick back up. Uh, and I was saying that the Tor browser, again, we're going to see it here in a few minutes. Uh, I'm sure most of, a lot of you are familiar with it. It's a great tool for communicating across the internet privately, moderately secure. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, show some resources later on. There are some ways to track it, but most of those focus on finding an exit node and then collecting data on the traffic from the exit node. On the other hand, Onion Services is another way to, that Tor can provide information. And basically it allows you to create your own endpoint on the Tor network. And then any other user can connect to that endpoint, which I'll demonstrate. In this case, it's functionally just like a VPN. The traffic is encrypted. And in most cases, the, your, your contents you're running inside the link are also encrypted, like SSH or SSL, the RTLS connection. If you want a Tor browser, it's pretty simple. Uh, SUSE has a package. Uh, I couldn't find one for Ubuntu. Uh, it may be there somewhere, but I didn't spend a lot of time on it. Uh, it's also, it's very easy to download it. In fact, there's one Linux download for everybody. Uh, and it's just basically uh, script collection that pulls a version of Firefox box in a specific configuration. Or you can run it in a container. Uh, I don't know if we'll have time for it tonight, but there's a bunch of them on Docker Hub. And I didn't have the time to go through it and pick one I like. All right, so let's talk about a Tor browser. Go ahead and start it, and then I'll share the screen. And where the screen go? Now, this is something I did not test. Would you believe Zoom will not share a Tor screen? I do not see it as an option. Suppose that's Tor browser locked down and not let it allowing. Now, there we go. Ah. It wasn't. Uh, I didn't have it enough, enough or fully on the page. Uh, anyway, so, as a point of information for uh, Ubuntu, there is a PPA 
that has the Tor browser. Okay. I'd be seriously surprised if there wasn't a Debian package already. Yeah. Uh, every time you start the Tor browser, it will check for updates. It's a six five one. Uh, you know, it's it's basically a, a Google search engine. Although, rem remember I said there is no JavaScript, no, no other scripting language allowed, but you can go, go anywhere you want. Now you can do regular searches. What is my IP? Where do we come up today? Black Host Limited. In Vienna. Okay. Cloudflare. Run through Cloudflare. Uh, you know, most of the script kitties out here are just looking for dark web stuff. And you don't have to worry about any three letter agencies tracking you. Or if you want to go to uh, you know how to build a pipe bomb, whatever. Uh, you know, I don't know if you can see it. It's fairly fast here because we're on a 200 meg charter connection. But I have seen cases where the connection is as slow as a old dial-up modem. Uh, and look, it's still still downloading components here. Wow, I think I'm gonna get off on that one. It is somewhat disappointing that the couple of the first uh, news articles that popped up there when you search for pipe bomb. Uh, we're actually just a town uh, a little bit north and uh, west of here. Uh, Boone, Boone County? Yep. That'll be done. Uh, one of the things that I found out you know, there are services out there that will prevent you from logging in. Uh, I don't know if they're doing geofencing or if they're specifically blocking Tor exit nodes. But, you know, you, you can't sign in on, on Yahoo, the Yahoo, if you have a, uh, if you, you know, if you're, if you're using the Tor browser. There may be a way to do it, but uh, remember, you're using a random IP. And theoretically, it's changing on every page, page load. So even if you get authenticated, the next time you load the page, your IP is going to change, and it's going to break whatever authentication you have. All right, any questions about a browser? Also, not to mention the fact that it's not very good OPSEC to be using uh, uh, Tor to log into things, uh, per se, necessarily. Yeah, because there's no traceability and, and no uh, network validation. Again, there's a number of uh, browsers with Tor. If you're going to the public inter internet, an exit note is required. Yeah, they're all over the world. But every time you exit through a Tor exit nose to get to the public internet, then your traffic is discoverable. It's pro it can be profiled. Uh, if, you, if you jump on the Wikipedia article, there's about 15 or 20 different tools there that can, public, that can uh, have been used to profile Tor traffic. Again, when it's leaving the network, going out of public exit nose. Another thing is every time you start the Tor browser, it checks for an update. Uh, and again, many public website services have issues with anonymous users, so your mileage may vary. 
All right, onion services. Now this is the interesting part. With an onion service, you are connecting into the Tor network to a egg to another node on the Tor network. Technically, they're dot onions, and that connection never leaves the Tor network, so it is fairly secure. God damn it! I'm sorry, guys. My hardware is actually crapping out here. Uh, -uh. uh let me reboot it again. I'll grab a fan real quick. It was acting up about three months ago. I actually got a a rise on or a, a rise on thread ripper, a core that I was playing with, and then it settled out when I updated the SUSE 15 too. I I was hoping it the problem was gone, but apparently not. Well, to be fair, uh, this is probably stressing that uh, poor little box a little more than what it's uh, used to. Well, yeah. It's uh, 8350. I think, shoot, I probably had it for six or seven years. And, you know, I've, I've been using it, you know, for 18, 20 hours a day with no problem, but Zoom doesn't like it. Okay, so we're talking about onion services. There's actually a lot of big names out there that, that provide an onion endpoint that you can talk to. Uh, you know, you can use port 80, 443, SSH, you know, basically you can open whatever connection you want. And if the endpoint supports that connection, you connect to the onion network. The Guardian, Guardian, Proton Mail, I mentioned before, Facebook, ProPublica. Anybody actually using a using their own onion endpoint for uh, more than play? So, uh, as I was hinting at when you were uh, uh, rebooting, uh, I actually, for a previous talk, had created a, a jump server that you could okay. jump back onto my network with uh, SSH. Okay. After the move, it uh, didn't get plugged back in. It's just a Raspberry Pi box. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've had too many uh, micro SDs die. I sort of slowed down on my Pi implementation. And I've got six or seven of them in the rack back there for email servers and DNS servers. And, but a couple I've had out in the field just rolled over on me after five or six years. Okay, anyway, Onion Services, step one, cloud. Uh, Bob has created a Tor endpoint that he's advertising. There are various introduction points set up in the cloud and there are public keys floating around. So when Bob advertises his endpoint, it is registered in the, the database of endpoints in the cloud. I'm sure there's a lot of three letter agen agencies that would like to get gain access to a database. Let's say Alice wants to talk to Onion X, XYZ Onion. So she tries, she tries to open a connection to XYZ Onion. That initiates a connection, a query to the database. And the database assigns a random rendezvous point. At that point, uh, Alice writes a message to Bob, which is uh, publicly encrypted, listing the rendezvous point in a one-time secret and ask an introduction point to deliver it to Bob. Then Bob connects to Alice's, the, Alice's rendezvous point and provides her a one-time secret, which Alice uses to set up a connection to Bob. Uh, very similar to uh, SSH handshake although it's done completely random and completely in the blind. You know, Alice and Bob never have any information about where they are, who they are, except the information contained within the services they're sharing. Make sense? Uh, again, uh, in SUSE, it's very simple. 
zipper install torque. Uh, that installs a standard set of tools. I'm going to bounce a fun on that for a while. The default or the service is in uh, TorRC slash Etsy slash Tor slash TorRC. And let me set up that screen. Let's do that one. Okay. For example, here's Tor, Tor RC. All right, let's look at the new one. See the hidden service section in here. Commented out in the in the original file. Into our C file. It's actually the one I used two years ago for a demo. We're defining it right here. So in this case, I'm going to tweak it. Uh, our standard application here is uh, we use 2206 for SSH. So I'm going to change that default Tor hidden service definition to be just a forward for port 2206. It could be 80, it could be 443. You know, lately I've started hiding SSH ports up in Ethereal, my standard. 54022. Uh, you know, whatever you want to do. So I've got that definition here. Twenty two oh six. Now Tor is running. Active and running. Of course, since I haven't specified it, I'm just taking the default. The host name is randomized. So this is my host name. Now, does that change every time you restart the Tor service? Right. Got it. There is a standard utility, Torify. So basically, I want to open a connection to that Onion node with SSH, which in this case is on port 2206. So Torify routes that traffic into the Tor network. Uh, sorry about that, I forgot. I shouldn't be doing it as root anyway. Now I'm back in my machine. And I have come in through the node that I defined on the Tor network.
Now, the interesting thing is how uh, Facebook and others have gotten those vanity addresses is mm -hmm. just through pure brute force generating uh, those random addresses until they come up with one that uh, looks like what they like. But then how do they maintain it? You know, if they, if they have to reset it? Exactly what my question was going to be. I uh, so uh, in, if you go back to your uh, config file there, uh, and uh, So in that uh, hidden services uh, directory, yeah. there are a couple other uh, files as well, oh, okay. I believe. So inside the, I think it's either like keys or something like that, there's the private key that connects up to that uh, uh, address, if I remember right. Yeah, and uh, in, in, in your service definition, in this case, hidden service. Yep. And so the, that private key is what uh, connects you back to that host name, if I remember right. If that were the case, then... Uh... EOJU... Okay, so that may not change. As long, as long as you maintain the same private key that you use to generate the endpoint, that's kind of interesting. Hold you won't. Yeah, uh, and the, the cool thing is you can have multiple different hidden services that you create. So uh, you can have, like, say, your SSH running at that onion address, a uh, web server running at a different one, and other than the, the fact that if they uh, connect up and do uh, hacking shenanigans to get onto the box itself, no one will be the wiser that you're both the Dread Pirate Roberts.onion and uh, the Princess Bride.onion. Yep. If you want to intentionally uh, change the name of your uh, endpoint address, like the host name, uh, all you need to do is like delete those files, maybe under that directory. Is that what you would do to refresh your Tor host name? I don't know if I need to clear <laughs> my question. Yeah, I'm looking back through my documents on exactly how I created that stuff. Yeah, you, 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 can't, you, you can change the service name. The service name is what you define. Uh, let me go back to the show. In other words, you can change the directory name here to change the service name on your system, but that doesn't change the uh, host name that's associated with the private key that was generated the first time you requested, you made a request from this node. Now the question is, Andrew, Will you use, will you have the same host name if you have more than one service on the node? Uh, so if you define uh, additional uh, uh, hidden service directories, so like say if you changed hidden service to hidden service one or something like that, and then uh, defined a new one, so like how you have that other hidden service, uh, it will actually end up being two separate keys and two separate uh, uh, entire folder structures there.
Yeah, I mean that's oh. a totally different difference than the than the other one. Very long too. I can't wait. Can we go downstairs? I wonder if the algorithm changed that much in two years, Andrew, or if it's just random. Uh, yes, so the algorithm did change in two years. They uh, went to a longer uh, key, so it's more secure in theory. You, the, the other address was a, uh, a shorter address, and uh, it, it was a shorter key, uh, yeah, consequently. Okay. It's not so much the endpoints, uh, uh, number of endpoints, uh, as much as it uh, makes it harder for a uh, three-letter uh, agency or nation state to guess what your uh, onion address is. Yeah, I've never tried this, so we just, I just define another hidden service port here if you wanted to like 443 also. Uh, yeah, you can just follow the directions uh, of that uh, second uh, commented out stuff down below uh, the service that you have right now. So notice how it has like 80 port, port 80 and 22. It's the same idea. And uh, one interesting thing of note, if you wanted to have your uh, the port that you're exposing out to the world, that 2206 there, uh, you could actually do 2206 and then have your uh, 127.001 uh, colon uh, 22. So you wouldn't have to uh, mess around with what port your, your actual SSH uh, client is at except for what's uh, globally visible. So I changed the 54022. That also uh, puts it way out of, uh, I haven't tried to hit it with Nmap, but most script kitties aren't going to go anywhere near that far into the uh, terminal ports. Yeah, so in this case, uh, your uh, 2206 would be when you SSH into it using your onion address, it would be visible on 2206. And then uh, that uh, huge long number you had there uh, would be uh, what you actually have it set up to run on your local uh, host. Right. Okay. So uh, one of the use cases that would be particularly useful for this is, say you have uh, multiple Apache servers, one's running on port 8081, one's running on 8082, et cetera. You could have multiple onion addresses all appearing as if they're on port 80, but then forwarding onto uh, the respective uh, uh, Apache servers. Right. Of course, if you did it with a load balancer in a container, you wouldn't have to worry about it. Yeah, it, it, multiple ways of doing it. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on uh, the simple service model? The, the other thing to point out here is that you can also have other addresses on site, uh, inside your internal network uh, other than localhost there and have it forward on to a local address. Yeah, as long as it's, as long as it's on the local, local subnet here, right? Oh, is that, is that how you set up your jump box by using a remote address? Yeah, if you, if you wanted to uh, be able to connect in uh, to, like say your NFS server or something like that, so you just put the uh, LAN IP number there instead of like 127.0.0.1, right? Yeah, so say you wanted to connect, uh, you were on like a 10.0.0.1 uh, network and your uh, SSH server over in your closet is uh, server number two, you'd just go 10.0.0.2. Got it. Genius. <laughs> and there is no way to... Uh, I mean, I, I think it defeats the purpose. So this is kind of like a silly question, but uh, let's say that you run a, a, 
define your host name, uh, you know, uh, in a way other than the algorithm provides, like the random algorithm. Is there a way to uh, kind of like define a name like that, or you are kind of like dependent on the algorithm that the Onion Services provides? So you are dependent. Uh, the way that uh, people like Facebook, if you notice, they have a vanity name. The way that they did that was by generating a whole lot of private keys until it hit uh, the one that they wanted. So uh, especially with those long addresses, you have to brute force an awful lot to before you get to something that just randomly happens to look like Facebook core, blah, 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 blah. Got it. So you can just uh, force the algorithm to start with a certain uh, kind of like the sequence of letters or whatever. Nope. The only way to do it is by a nation state level esque okay. uh, stack of VMs uh, just brute forcing the heck out of things. Got it. which is also why they've gone to uh, such a long address space is because it did become possible by just buying up a uh, good stack of a data center for uh, a whole bunch of hours uh, to brute force your way into getting a, a private key like uh, facebook.onion. That must have taken tens of millions of dollars to do service starts to even think about that, but then they would have had done that a long time ago to get us that short. Uh, so you can still, I believe there's a way that you can uh, short circuit it to use the old uh, uh, key length. So do you guys have an idea how the um, authoritarian countries uh, can block the Tor traffic? Are they essentially just um, uh, putting the like the Tor entry points into some sort of like a blacklist, although it is now uh, like the uh, outdated term. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, so there's a couple different ways that you can do it uh, through deep packet inspection. You can just uh, start messing with stuff that looks like Tor traffic. Uh, I mean, it it all looks fairly predictable-ish. It's encrypted, but it, it all smells about the same. Uh, the other stuff you can do is uh, by uh, blocking uh, the, the endpoints. There are bridge servers that people have set up that you can connect to connect onto Tor, and those are always changing and uh, etc. But uh, like Great Firewall they, there's all sorts of shenanigans they can do to uh, make it more difficult for you. Plus, then uh, there's never to discount the fact that all they have to do is just catch you doing it, and then it's a rubber hose cryptography uh, level uh, effort to figure out uh, what you're uh, doing. All they have to do is just lock you in a, a dark cell and uh, beat you with a hose till you tell them. Uh, Torify is what we use for SSH. It basically encapsulates that traffic into a link into the Tor network. Uh, you can also call it proxification, soxification, or transoxification. All right, the test worked. Uh, I did it on my machine, just uh, package install. That's what I did a gazillion years ago, or three or two or two or three years ago, whatever. Um, I didn't even think to check if there's a container for it. Now, Andrew, any advantage of running it in a container? Uh, so the, I mean, you, you do have a little bit of advantage in the fact that 
uh, it's the the whole cattle versus uh, pet argument where you can just blow it away and it's ephemeral uh, as well as there's a little bit more security in the fact that you've got several things running on your local server uh, where with having it be inside a container it's somewhat abstracted away okay i think i also heard about Unix um, uh, as a vm uh, maybe a little bit more um, uh, headspace or whatever like uh, overhead i guess that's what i meant uh, like being vm instead of a container uh, but that is supposed to be a little bit more anonymity providing vm i guess as opposed to running Tor in your main os Yeah, you get almost all the benefits of having a VM with uh, less weight. Yeah, because all you need is what's in the container. All right, talked about some resources. Uh, Tor project is very informative. There's all kinds of extra resources on there. Onion service, YouTube videos. And last week, or over the weekend, I was going through the presentation. I got to the third slide, and I realized that I actually borrowed some of the graphics from Andrew's presentation about five years ago. So thank you. Any questions? That's it. Well, cool. Thank you.